Along with Anna Hart, and as you can see from the title, we're going to go ahead and finish the series on Rules of Rulers, in which we would go into democracy. Um, if you want to catch up with everything that was going on, dictatorship was two weeks ago. Um, so we're going to finish the series. Also, a PSA that this will be the final series for a while. I don't know how long. We're going to start getting back into current events that's going on in the United States and around the world. Starting next week with, so I can put up more pressure on her. Anna Hart is taking over all the international news that's going on. And this is going to be this. <laughs> so I don't have anything else to say, really. Theus, how's everything going? Things are going okay. No major complaints. I'm good. How is y'all? Anna, oh, that was quick. You said should be right back. It may be the internet. By the way, my internet. Yeah, how about you, man? Um, without giving away when I'll be leaving, I'm just in vacation mode right now. I honestly don't care too much about things. I mean, obviously, I care about society and about what's going on in this country but um yeah i busted my butt for over a year to get the vacation that i wanted and 
I'm gonna enjoy it. So I'm just in vacation mode now. So yeah. Um that's cool. Other than that, not much is going on. I actually did have a boring weekend. Yesterday's show was phenomenal, though. I mean, I we poor Anna. Anna laughed so hard on one of the stories, which I just have to send it to you, Thea's, because I just can't. I don't want to play it on the show no more. It was just so stupid. But I'll send it to you later. But anyway. I don't have nothing. So without further ado, let's get this party started. All right, so rules of rulers, we are on now to democracy. Um, you're going to see some similarities between dictatorship and democracy, but just slight changes here and there. Um, so the first video is how they get voters on their side. So let us discuss rulers as representatives. You, again, might have grand dreams of the utopia you wish to build, but no man rules alone, and never more so than in democracy. Presidents and prime ministers must negotiate with their senates and parliaments and vice versa, and they all have their own key supporters to manage. In a well-designed democracy, power is fractured among many and is taken not with force, but with words, meaning you must get thousands or millions of citizens to, if not like you on election day, at least like you better than the alternative. With so many voters and such fractured power, it's impossible to, as a dictator would, follow these rules and buy loyalty. Or is it? Of course not. Don't think of citizens as individuals with their individual desires, but instead as divided into blocks. The elderly or homeowners or business owners or the poor. Blocks you can reward as a group. Democracies have wildly complicated tax codes and laws not as accident but as reward for the blocks that get and keep the ruling representatives in power. Farming subsidies, for example, have nothing to do with the food a nation needs but entirely with how key the vote of the farming block is. Countries where farmers vote don't swing elections don't have farming subsidies. If a block doesn't vote, such as younger citizens, then no need to divert rewards their way. Even if large in number, they are irrelevant to gaining power. Which is good news for you. One less block to sway, and the treasure you give your key blocks has to come from somewhere. If you want long years in office, Rule 3 is your friend in a democracy just as much as a dictatorship. You can't eliminate those who don't vote for you, but there is still much you can do. Once in power, make it easier for your key blocks to vote and harder for others. Establish voting systems that reduce the number of blocks you need to win the more rivals you get. Very handy indeed. Draw election borders to predetermine the results for you or your cronies, and have party pre-elections with Byzantine rules to determine who blocks even can vote for. Mix and match the above for even better power perpetuation. When approval ratings couldn't be lower, yet re-election rates couldn't be higher, you'll know you've succeeded. Um... <clears throat> That's just nice way um, voter blocks. Um, that was just a real nice way of saying gerrymandering. That was really nice <clears throat> way of saying it. But that's what he was saying at the end. Um, putting key blocks in already predetermined signed areas to already decide on what, how the vote is going to go. Um, 
That, that was just so, I'm sorry. I just can't get that out of my head. That was the sweetest way I've ever heard Jerry Mandarin in my life. But anyway, I'm going to stop talking. Is No, uh, <clears throat> he was sitting on Jerry Mandarin, um, but really it's it's bigger than that, which is why he, he did it the way he did it with the four squares. Because the gerrymandering is the part where you do the breaking and the packing, right? Where, okay, if I do it this way, everybody gets equal shot. If I do it this way, then I get a little bit more. If I do it this way, I get a whole lot more. How do we rearrange the voting districts so that it swings one way or the other based on who's in power, right? That's the gerrymandering piece of it. But then the other part of it is if you notice some of the illustrations he was using, this is where you look at, okay, um how do i make i'm going to use more current terms for us here in america uh, where do i place my voting drop boxes um how easy do i make it to vote by mail um, how do i make um, absentee ballots factor into the system so that they're not basically the same as if you showed up on voting day um, how do i set up early voting so that my particular group is more likely to come out and vote over time because they speaking as them like the democratic party they know that they draw their power from the larger masses right they don't listen to them but they draw their power from the larger masses well that means the larger masses are disproportionately on the lower end of the income scale so they're more vulnerable to their work schedules and and things like that so early voting is very important for that group so the democrats want to make sure you have early voting or longer hours at the polls, or uh, more drop boxes versus less, right? And then the Republicans on the other side, more of their people are very homogenous. They're more rural in many cases, so things can be more static where their bases are. So they're not as concerned about extended windows of time. Their people will go vote on voting day, right? Um, so it's that's what it's a weird thing to kind of point out but like a lot of times people cry racism or discrimination and really what it is is power politics you know and it manifests with some racial or discriminatory outcomes but it's really power politics they're playing to win right based on who their bases are and that's that's really kind of what I was picking up from what he was saying in the video. All right, Anna. The only thing the only thing I would add to that is here what he points out at the very end. If your uh, your popularity numbers are at an all time low, but you are reelected every time. Then what you're doing is working. Because, yeah, this is all about staying in power. This is not about doing what is right for the people. This is not about equity, fairness, or anything like that. It's about power. And, and we have to remember our politicians are very much in that. Sorry, Cliff? Yeah. Sorry. No, I was just gonna say, and, and the thing is, and I and I've made this point in the past, it's really largely our fault as citizens why it's as broken as it is. So remember this is coming out of they were afraid of having a king, right? King has too much too much power, so they decided to create a president and the Congress and all the other structures of all, right? And what did the Cong what role did the Congress play in a monarchy? Well, in a monarchy, the king didn't have a Congress, but he had nobles and dukes and duchesses and all these other people whose job was to sit between the okay. king and the people, right? And the king made sure that the, the dukes and, and so forth got rich, right? He'd keep them from having power, but he would make sure they had money and wealth, right? And that's what Congress does. Congress is so big that no one congressperson really has that much power, but they get rich. And they get richer by playing the role of being a buffer. 
reason why I say this is on us is because most of us don't want to participate. So when you look at uh, that little part of the video that you showed where they were pointing at the youth, name your group. If you're behaving in this manner, this is why you're being ignored. Like you, you'll say, well, they're not listening to us anyway, so I'm not going to. I'm not going to participate. OK, so what you're going to do is you're going to complain. You're going to complain very loudly and you're going to complain very energetically. But at the end of the day, less than 60, 40, 50, 60 percent of you are going to bother coming out to vote. All right. So if I know you're going to have that type of a drop off, why am I going to pay attention to you? All right? I can ignore you because you're just making noise. Meanwhile, the smaller group that votes at 100 percent, I have to pay attention to them because I need them. So that's why I was saying this really comes back to us. And then the thing with the low approval, high re, uh, re-election, once again, that's us. But they created a system to make us as dis, disenchanted as we are so that we don't bother to participate. So it's like both sides are playing their part to make this thing as pathetic as it as it really is, you know? So you want better representation, you need to start voting more. And then you need to vote, you need to be more considerate and intentional about who you're voting for. You, you go in there and vote for Sam Joker because his name said incumbent. That's how you have a Congress with a, what, 11, 12% approval rating and a 90% reelection. So, yeah, we just need to step up and be more accountable for what we do. All right. Um, Captain Sunshine, greetings, friends. Can't stay on long, but saw you was on. Wanted to say hello, Captain, if you're still here. Hello. Thank you for coming. Everything okay, Anna? LL, impoverished people are this proportionately black, brown, and minority. It depends on how you slice that pie. Yeah. Um, See, obstructed and, and oppressed people are disproportionately those groups. But impoverished? Whole lot of poor white people in America. Yeah. Right. But they've been sold a bill of goods. They've been sold no matter how bad it is for you, at least you're not them. Right. So that even the lowest white person is considered more than the highest black person. That's our history. But now in the last, let's say, 40 years, thereabouts, it's been disrupted. And now we're seeing the culmination of that where the the poor and, and lower working class whites are seeing that the American dream was a lie and they don't know how to react to it. So they're trying to latch on to this dream, the American dream, because it's been sold to them and they really want it to be true. And so they're, they're scared and they're angry. So they're lashing out in the most easy thing to lash out at are minorities. But they're seeing right now that the American dream is a lie and they're trying to find a way to reconcile with that. And unfortunately, this should be a time for people to like, oh, wait a minute. We have overlapping interests. These people are taking advantage of all of us. Um, the reason why I don't have the same opportunities with jobs is because they sent the jobs overseas, you know, or they are pushing automation to the detriment of their employees, of their workers, or they're making sure that all our tax money goes in. But in the middle of a plague, we got to figure out if we'll let you have a couple hundred dollars. Right. So it, it's it's all smoke and mirrors. But unfortunately, we're in a, 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 a reactionary phase where it's still white people over here. Everybody else over there, but in reality, we're all fighting at the bottom against the exact same power structure. And let me read these back okay. to back. Yes, but the impoverished democracy, uh, 
demographic doesn't match population demographic. But then Captain comes back with, I live in white trash trailer parks and we all poor, but it amazes me how many of them are Trump supporters. Right. So well, America so, is an aspirational place. And, and and that's one thing I really wish more people would slow down and really dig into. Like, okay, I do fight and, and, and focus a lot on the racial line because even though racism is a poor man's war, it's not a real thing. It's real enough that it's taking people's lives and it's and it's getting in the way of people making a living. So you have to fight that war, even though you know it shouldn't be a real war. But at the same time, very aware, very cognizant of the fact that people have been sold this image of America. And reason why we're not all reacting the same way is because black and brown communities have always known that it was a lie. <laughs> it was always kept away from us. We had the hope of one day it would be better, but it's never been real for us. But in the white community, the only thing that could generally separate the poor white person from these jokers at the top is opportunity. They could sell to you that if you just work harder, if you just make the right decisions, if you just go to the right school, if you just pray to the right God, if you, all this stuff, then you too could be just like me because you look just like me. And that was good enough up until about 40 years ago. And now it's starting to unravel. And now you're starting to see, yeah, they don't care about you. But it's still too early for poor, pardon the language, white. Well, no, this is it poor white people? But I can't use the term that 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 the speaker, the um, commenter used. But poor white people is still too early for them to truly rationalize and break free of something that has been forced down their throat since they were children. They'll get to it, but it's gonna be real ugly before they get there. All right, let's go on ahead and move on. Um, the same thing with um, with democracy is the, the same thing with dictatorship is you still got to get your key players. Now, enough with thinking about the citizens. Even in a democracy, there still are very influential individual key supporters you need on your side because their money or influence or favors keeps you in power. While you can't just promise to give them treasure directly as a dictator would, you can create loopholes for their investments, pass laws that they've written, or print get out of jail free cards for their actions. Not a wheelbarrow of gold to the door, but contracts for their business. You as a ruler do have roads to build or computers to maintain or buildings to reconstruct. No man rules alone, after all. Or you could take the moral path and ignore the big keys, but you'll fight against those who didn't. Good luck with that. Corruption is not some kind of petty crime, but rather a tool of power in democracies and dictatorships. But more on that another time. So accept the favors, sway the key blocks, and you will get into power, ruling with actions that look contradictory and stupid to those who don't understand the game, privately helping a powerful industry you publicly denounced, or passing laws that hurt a block that voted for you. But your job isn't to have a consistent, understandable ruling policy, but to balance the interests of your keys to power, big and small. That is how you stay in office. Man, I wish more people were intelligent enough to absorb this video. Well, but they're not. They. I got so sick of going. I must have PTH, PTH, PTSD during the Trump years, because I still keep bringing up some of the stupidest arguments that I hear. And one of them was always the fact that they kept saying, well, you don't want to vote for Trump because he, orange man back. Or you don't like Trump. 
or whatever the reason, whatever emotional thing other than, okay, I'm trying to use political knowledge and you're trying to use emotional knowledge. I don't like him. I feel that he's a bad guy. All this other stuff. And I'm just more or less just saying, no, the dude is dangerous to this country. His policies is dangerous. His policies is balanced in one way and one way only. And it isn't for you, the person that's doing the argument. And you don't see that. They're not in the job when you are in office to be consistent. That's not their job. Their job is to get into office. And then their second job now is to stay in office. Kind of. And if they have to, to, if they found a new bridge that's better than the old bridge that got them into office, they have no problem burning it. The old bridge. Now, granted, I'm on shoot themselves in the foot when they realize that mm, I, I need that old bridge back now. All right, so, so uh, Marlon, you you but closed, still, so we missed what you said. Yeah. Oh uh, well, it wasn't a, it wasn't important. But well, I would say though, man, it's it's not even just okay. So on the cynical <laughs> level, we're not getting what you're saying. We, yeah. We see your mouth move, but nothing, and then then like that, you're frozen. So yeah, but. On the cynical level, uh, politicians are trying to get in office so they can get so they can stay in office so that they can provide benefits to their family and their friends. That's that's the most cynical level that 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 you can look at it, and it's real. But that's not all there is to it. Also, what happens? This is why when they get in office and they don't deliver on all the promises that you want to say that they said that they were going to do, right? Biden said he was going to get rid of student loan debt, this, that, and the third. Because there's a difference between campaigning and actually having to run something. So once you get in position, that's when the real work starts. Now you have to balance power and balance favors. And a lot of the people who are looking for you to help them and looking for you to deliver positive things for them have no power. So it's hard to sit there and say, okay, I'm going to get rid of student loan debt when the people who actually keep you in power, the ones who actually put money in your pocket, the one that, that actually can, like if you pick up the phone call and you call uh, Sir Dudley Johnson, who owns this mega company over here, well, Dudley Johnson can call five senators and have them do what he tells them to do. So you need to make sure he's happy, right? Versus me. And ten thousands of me saying that I want student loan debt. I can't do nothing for you though. I have no money. I'm I'm not even a factor until it's time to vote, and I'm always voting scattered. In fact, I'll line up and and vote down party line because it gets too com too complicated. It's too much. It's too overwhelming. Plus, our system is designed to, to basically herd you like cattle back into back in the line. So. Yeah, it, it's really important for people to really take the original video and really just watch it multiple times if that's what you need. Because yeah. you need to have a realistic view of what you're dealing with. I'm not saying emotions aren't important because emotions, that's what that's what spurs energy, that, that spurs action. But you have to face reality. There are no comic book villains here. And there are no comic book heroes, right? They're in it for themselves professionally, just like you are at work. And they just play it at a higher level. And they have to play the game or they get pushed out and can't do anything for you anyway. That's the reality of it. All right, Anna. I, I don't have much to add at this point. Okay. 
Dudley Johnson always screw things up from behind the scenes. <laughs> and hey, Parker, coming in joking. All right, so let's move on. Now, me and Theos was talking about this earlier when I was saying there is a difference between democracy and dictatorship, and it was the the um that I figured that dict democracy was more paper laws, regulations, get out a free card. I forgot about that part that he said, but that's so true. And dictatorship was more of money, 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 money. I'm not absolutely correct on that, though, not because I forgot. There is a certain thing of, when it comes to democracy and money, and that's taxes. Now, with all this headache of being a representative, you may wonder, looking at Rule 3, why couldn't you skip all this block-building, favor-trading nonsense and just bribe the army to take power? We must finally turn to taxes and revolts. You must understand Rule 2 and how the treasure is raised and used to hold the country together. If we graph the tax rate of countries versus the number of key supporters the ruler needs, there's a clear relationship. More democracy, lower taxes. If you're sitting comfortably in a cushy democracy, you may scoff at this, but you are fellow citizens who don't earn enough, don't pay income taxes, and get rebates, bringing the average tax rate down. In dictatorships, this doesn't happen. Dictatorships often forego tax paperwork in favor of just taking wealth directly. It's common for the dictator to force farmers to sell their produce to him for little, then turn around and sell it on the open market, pocketing the difference at an unthinkably high equivalent tax rate. So taxes in democracies are low in comparison to dictatorships. But why do representatives lower their take? Well, cutting taxes is a crowd pleaser. Dictators have no need to please the crowds and thus can take a large percentage from their poor citizens to pay key supporters. But representatives in a democracy can take a smaller percentage from each to pay their key supporters because their educated, freer citizens are more productive than peasants. For rulers in a democracy, the more productivity, the better, which is why they build universities and hospitals and roads and grant freedoms, not just out of the goodness of their hearts, but because it increases citizen productiveness, which increases treasure for the ruler and their key supporters, even when a lower percentage is taken. Democracies are better places to live than dictatorships, not because representatives are better people, but because their needs happen to be aligned with a large portion of the population. The things that make citizens more productive also make their lives better. Representatives want everyone productive so everyone gets highways. This video is one that needs to, like, every middle school and high school needs to have an opportunity to watch. But the problem, here's why it would never happen, though. Um, our teachers are not in a position and they're not provided the authority to teach. So what will happen is you'll give these kids this information, they'll just confuse them and they'll just be angry. And then you end up with a less productive workforce coming out of it. <clears throat> but this is real. This is this is what it is, you know. Um, when you have a democracy, you gotta have a lot more people, so it looks like you're being more fair because your 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 incentives are different, right? With what you're after is also different, you know. That's why America and the other in their peer group, they're not like North Korea, right? North Korea has a small group of highly educated, highly trained, highly specialized people but a huge population with no education and no skills because it's more beneficial to that model to have an undereducated group who is so there's less potential for them to uh, revolt because they are not they know they're not in a position to run things if they do revolt versus if you educate people to a certain point and you're not giving them rewards and you're not making their life better Educated people who don't have options rebel. <laughs> so it, it it all it all works itself out. 
but it's it's so much more than democrat republican conservative liberal it's it's power dynamic it's it's all about power dynamic i'll give you an example of exactly what the guy was saying and i want everybody to think back to let's say the middle of the first wave of the pandemic um and you would think at this point in time there was a, you would be concerned and you were that i'm not saying that it wasn't i'm not i repeat i'm not saying there were people that wasn't saying about the deaths and the hurt and the loss of a lot of people during COVID, I'm not talking about that. Just to make it perfectly clear. But you did hear, because I heard it a lot, that the majority of people, not the majority, sorry, not the majority, but there are a lot of people who biggest complaint was productivity is down. We just don't have the people to work. People don't want to work anymore. What about the businesses that have to close down? What about so instead of saying, because this this is how America thinks. So instead of saying, hey, let's get this thing under control so we can get back to work, still an icky thing to talk about. But fine, let's go your route. Let's get this under control. Let's get this pandemic under control so we can get back to work, so we can get back to production, so we can get everybody working again. Instead, you want to pretend it really doesn't exist. Or even if it does exist, it's as bad as the flu. I, I, that's how much you were so willing to keep your well-educated people being productive is to constantly put the gaslight them so much to put them in harm's way of dying. I have to push back on that one, bro. Because really what they did, think about how, they, how it played out. And I'm, and I'm going to use myself as an example. I'm what you consider to be like lower mid tier, right? I'm your professional class. I got to go home. Okay. I got, there was no disruption to my check. I got to switch up and go work remote. Uh, that's what America did. And if you look at it in the viewpoint of what you were just laying out, those are the whole key thing, right? Because the people at the bottom were were reclassified as what was it what what was the term um, like critical workers you know what I mean they were like essential workers essential right? workers to essential yeah right you you all of a sudden became essential workers which and then that's the same group the same tier of workers that America wouldn't rally around to make sure they had PPE in the hospitals. They're the same group that America, as soon as things started to get a little more under control, were saying, you need to get back to work. I need my coffee. I need my lunch, right? So it, it still fits the model, Marlon, because your more educated or more professional tier was very well taken care of. It was the working class and below that were left out there to fend for self. And yes, they did turn around and start talking about this, that nobody wants to work, right? Um, but that was not out of concern. That was because the system needs them. America doesn't make things anymore. America is a service economy. So if you aren't out there providing all these services, which are mainly going to be your working class people, then you're not just disrupting my convenience as a middle class person. 
you're also disrupting the machine of America. And that means we can't pay for the things that you ultimately will need. So it all works. It all works together. All right, Anna. Once again, I, I don't really have a whole lot to add. All right, to everybody that wants to see the, the full video, it is completely uh, gone ahead and put it in the um, comment version. You could just click on it and see for yourself. That is the full video itself. Um, so you can um, go click on it, save it to watch later because uh, we're almost done with the first hour. Yeah, the things like grocery store workers, food workers, Amazon, UPS delivery workers. Yeah. Um, you don't know what you miss until it's gone. And, well, and not only that, but you're largely, this is, this is, follow the point I'm trying to make less than how you're going to feel about what I'm about to say. Folks. So it takes me back to when I worked retail and, um, at the, the company I worked for, they had these kiosks. I don't know if y'all remember, but when you go to like the big retail companies, there's a kiosk near the front door or near the customer service place where you go and you apply for a job. <laughs> right. Um, I still have it may still have that. I don't know. I, I don't ever go into stores anymore for the most part, which I'm part of the problem, right? Cause I don't go into stores anymore, but <clears throat> my manager, who ran the entire facility? He was. We were doing our, our walk, and I don't know why he made this point to me, but I think it's probably because I was complaining about like my team needed more hours or, or something like that. And he said, "Over at that kiosk, you'll get. I mean, we'll get a couple hundred applications every week for our team members, right?" That's your cashiers, your sales floor, your customer service, all that. Couple hundred applications every week. And then he said, now for your position, I might get 10, 15 every week. And then for my position, two or three. So when you look at it from that lens, that's how the government looks at things. That's how your jobs look at things. That's even how we look at things, right? How hard is it for me to replace your role in this machine? So it's a lot of people who are in tough situations that'll come and take that job to, to make me coffee. But there's not as many people who are qualified to come in and run that coffee store. And there's not as many people who are qualified and ready to come in and run a series of coffee stores. So when the people who have the least uh, transferable skills are complaining about how they're being treated, that's why you're being treated so, so unfairly. Because in a capitalist system, how hard is it for me to replace you? So if you're wondering, wondering why these people were reclassified as essential workers this does not include law enforcement fire and medical they were called essential workers but they actually are essential workers <laughs> but all the rest of us no we were called essential because we were replaceable we were expendable and that's how the model the model works and if we want to change that dynamic we got to get together and say you know what yes i don't have whatever educational opportunities are needed for me to be here, or I didn't get the right break to be over here or whatever it is, but we can all work together and lobby together for what we need. That's why we have unions. So that's, that's one of the ways we fight back, you know, but just complaining about it, you end up like the little youth diagram in the video where they just be like, <laughs> and you get ignored. All right, let's move on. The first hour is almost up. We've got three more videos to go through, and the last two is really short. So let's look at 
re revolt. Remember the first part said taxes and revolt. So we're going to look at revolt um, from the lens of a um, dictatorship. The worst dictators are those whose incentives are aligned with the fewest citizens, those who have the fewest keys to power. This explains why the worst dictatorships have something in common, gold or oil or diamonds or similar. If the wealth of a nation is mostly dug out of the ground, it's a terrible place to live because a gold mine can run with dying slaves and still produce great treasure. Oil is harder, but luckily foreign companies can extract and refine it without any citizen involvement. With citizens outside this cycle, they can be ignored while the ruler is rewarded and the keys to power kept loyal. Thus, we live in a world where the best, smartest democracies are stable, the worst, richest dictatorships are stable, and in between is a valley of revolution. The resource-rich dictators build roads only from their ports to their resources and from their palace to the airport, and the people stay quiet not because this is fine or even because they're scared, but because the cold truth is starving, disconnected illiterates don't make good revolutionaries. Now, a middling dictator without resources must, as mentioned before, take a large amount of wealth directly from his poor farmers and factory workers. Thus, two roads won't do and so he must maintain some minimums of life for the citizens. But keeping the workforce somewhat connected and somewhat educated and somewhat healthy makes them more able to revolt. Now understand, the romantic image of the people storming the gates and overthrowing their dictator is mostly a fantasy. If you run a middling dictatorship, the people only storm the palace when the army lets them to remove you because you lost control over your keys and are being replaced. This is why after popular revolts in middling dictatorships, the new ruler is often the same as the old, if not worse. The people didn't replace the king, the court replaced the king using the people's protest they let happen to do it. The very things a benevolent dictator wants to build to cross this valley take treasure away from the keys to power and make the citizens more able to revolt, often ending in a stronger ruler less likely to build bridges and more loyal to his keys. You're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Make, You're muted. Make one quick point. Yeah. Make one quick point, and then I'll drop because I've already made most of my points about this part. This part of the video. Notice with uh, Donald Trump, just using him as an example. His keys, with very few exceptions, are still in place, and the ones who did fall off already have replacements ready. And that's part of the things I would like for you to like pull out of that little segment of the video. Because, yeah, you can go get Trump, but you're not really getting the keys. No one in Congress has really been held accountable. And that's the court. So the courts and Congress, um, was it uh, Clarence Thomas and his wife, right? And then the, the MAGA crowd in Congress, they're all still in place. So when they give up on Trump, then Trump will go out of the way. Because that is age, they're going to get rid of them anyway. And then they're going to bring somebody else in to do the work. Right. Anna, you got anything? I just, I want people to pay attention to how this video is pointing out that all of the things we think are power in our hands and the things we think are controllable are not. They are permissible. Big difference. So, yeah, when look at all the revolutions that have happened where a people supposedly stand up and replace either their rulers or their government. The army allowed it. 
that even in Russia, where you had hundreds of thousands of people still in the streets, they still weren't in control. Okay. It's sobering. It's it's very sobering. And it does take you know, when you were saying that, you know, we, teachers can't just bring this up, if they were to say, hey, boss, I, I have a video and I'd really love to talk to my students about it, watch how fast that will be crushed. If it's something of actual consequence. So, no, it was a very well done video. It was a little confusing going out of order for me. But yeah, you, you got to make sure that if you're running a government or an organization, you want to control the amount of disruption. And that's where it all comes in. And like you were saying about the military, nothing moves without the military. Right, because they they're the best trained, and they can go seize, you know, whatever they need to seize. And then, and and I didn't think about it until you were just saying that, Anna. I can't come up with the clear examples, but I know you've seen it just as I've seen it over the years, where there will be a military coup or a military takeover, but the military itself seldom keeps the power; they just take things over. And then go find a puppet to come play the role of politician, and they go right back to being military. Keep the, I'm gonna go ahead and play these last two videos back to back. Funny thing that you just say the word coup. So we're gonna look at the same revolt, but we're gonna look at it from. Democracy. On the other side, the best democracies are stable, not just because the large number of keys and their competing desires makes dictatorial revolt near impossible to organize, but also because the revolt would destroy the very wealth it intended to capture, the high productivity of the citizens. Plus, those helping the would-be dictator in a democracy know he plans to cull key supporters once in power. That's what a coup is. So potential key supporters must weigh the probability of surviving the cull and getting the rewards versus the risk of being on the outside of a dictatorship they helped create. In a stable democracy, that's a terrible gamble. Maybe you'll be incredibly wealthy, but probably you'll be dead and have made the lives of everyone you know worse. The math says no. Being on the right side of a coup in a dictatorship means having the resources to get you and your family what the peasants lack. Healthcare, education, quality of life. This is what makes the competition for power so fierce. But in a democracy, most already have these things, so why risk it? So the more the wealth of a nation comes from the productive citizens of the nation, the more the power gets spread out and the more the ruler must maintain the quality of life for those citizens. The less the less. Now, if a stable democracy becomes very poor, or if a resource that dwarfs the productivity of the citizens is found, the odds of this gamble change and make it more possible for a small group to seize power. Because if the current quality of life is terrible, or the wealth not dependent on the citizens, coups are worth the risk. When democracies fall, these are usually the reasons. I'm not even mm. gonna get into it. If I have to explain to you, give you an example of a coup, you really haven't been paying attention to this show for the last four years. So I'm not even gonna waste my time. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. It's not even worth my time to even go into it. So let's just go on ahead and get to um the conclusion.
These rules for rulers explain not only why some men are monsters and others are merciful, but everything about politics, from war to foreign aid to political dynasties to corruption, all of which we can talk about at another time. But for now, you aspiring ruler may be disgusted by the world of politics and have decided to avoid it entirely. But you cannot, for rulers come in many forms. Yes, kings, presidents, and prime ministers, but also deans, dons, mayors, chairs, chiefs. These rules apply to all and explain their actions. From the CEO of the largest global corporate conglomerate who must keep his board happy to the chair of the smallest homeowners association, managing votes and spending membership fees. You cannot escape structures of power. You can only turn a blind eye to understanding them. And if you ever want the change you dream about, there's a zeroth rule you cannot ignore. Without power, you can affect nothing. You may not like these rules, but surely better you on the throne than someone else. And who knows, maybe you'll be different. So that's it. I love how he closed it out. I really think it was enough to move into a whole nother video for him, which maybe he'll do in the future. But um yeah, because I'm gonna use. Go ahead. Just that I would hope that he would um, elaborate more on the ending because there's a lot unsaid there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. like when it comes to, I'm gonna use it as like business, you know. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll even use myself with with within this because there's a uh, as y'all watch me. There's different sides of me. That are all moving at the same time. So, on one hand, like I'm fiercely committed to my community, the black community specifically. And I'm always, you always hear me saying, you got to get in a position to compete. You need to be able to compete for resources and for better treatment. And that means you got to start working on our, we got to start working on ourselves, working on our attitude and, our, and focusing our energies, right? Because as he said, without power, you can't affect anything, right? You can do all the complaining you want. You can play every moral card you want to, but if you don't have any leverage to play upon, then you're really like a child sitting in the corner crying. And what do you do with a child who's crying? If you can't reason with them, you ignore them, right? <laughs> and so that's, to my brothers and sisters in the struggle, and even if you're not in the black community, but you are working with your special interests or what have you, that's really important. Without power, without leverage, you can't get anywhere. And if we look at some of the groups who have managed to play that a little differently, like for example, the LGBTQ community, they went in this from the span of the 70s to the early 2000s, they worked very hard to get the education and get the uh, pathways in that they needed before they started making some of the louder demands. Because by the time they started making those demands, they had CEOs, they had politicians, they had professionals all over the place. So you had to listen to them. The Jewish community, similar thing. They're in positions. If they make a demand, you got to hear them because they're in places that can really mess things up for you if you ignore them wholesale. But the dis the, the persons with disabilities community, if you ignore them, what they're gonna do? Right? The black community, if you ignore us, what you, what we gonna do? We're we gonna march? We're gonna complain? Right? You have to get yourself in a position to have leverage. And then with the business side of it, that's also important for those of us who aspire to be leaders and build things. You will be part of this key system. You know, and you got to figure out what type, what type of key holder you're going to be because you're going to be playing the game. You go, you have to. It's the nature of our power moves. That's all. Alan, final words. What he has said is applicable to so many different kinds of social movements, you know, just 
take the uh, the support group. I heard of a need. I was like, let's try this. Now, when I got people coming, I was realizing I have to keep key people happy in the spotlight and um, focused on that is just like, you know, being a leader, whether you're going to say, um, a king, a president, a CEO, a facilitator. It is seen before you what what is needed, working out how can I leverage the people around me to produce that what is needed and how do I keep it going for a long term? And that has taken different people. It has taken different ideas. It has taken the, the leader position actually away from me. And I'm quite happy about that. I'm more happy when there's um, a balance of power, when we're all saying, you know, are we getting what we need out of this? And if we are not, how can we change? There is no real money that comes into this. Um, um, I'm lacking a word the, uh, this industry, I guess. Um, but the currency is how you make people feel. Make people feel heard, supported, loved, cared for. And they will give you back so much work, so much trust. And you have to hope that the person who has all that trust is not going to abuse it. That's why I would rather the, so just to, uh, to wrap up, I would rather the power be held by many and not by a single person. So I, I I look at it like kind of a multi-directional type of thing. Like um, mm -hmm. the bigger or more successful your endeavor is, what you will find is you will be spending less and less time doing the thing that you are most passionate about doing. The more success you are, because you do have to shift, right? When, when it's you building, like right now I'm on the ground floor building my organization. That means I'm some of everything. And as people come on board, I'll play different roles or whatever, but really I'm still hands on doing the things I want to do. But as it grows, what I'm needed to do will shift. And I won't, I won't be doing the hands on things because I'll have to entrust that to other people who are better positioned to do those things because what I'm needed for is going to be I got to be over here to do a conference over here to, to raise money or I got to make sure that the people who are running the multiple chapters across different counties or states, they're getting what they need. And then, right, like it all shifts and it moves. And hopefully you work for someone or hopefully I'll become that someone that you recognize when what you are is no longer the best fit for what you're doing. Right. And then you can shift that too. Right. Um, I think could be right, could be wrong. 
and it doesn't fit across the board. But small things, you generally do need someone who's more like a dictator, right? And you, because a dictator is not a bad word. It's it's a person who dictates everything. So mm-hmm. on a small level, you might need a dictator because things need to get done. Right. We can't do consensus views on everything. Right. But the bigger a thing gets, the more leadership you need, the more uh, uh, specialized talents you need. So then you start having to get more voices and then you got to figure out a different structure that fits that. In America is something like a quasi democracy. It's a representative democracy. Right. But then in Europe, it's a parliamentary democracy. Right. It, It. you have to figure out what works best for you. But there's a point where democracy, I don't think that's always the best move. Because then you got too many people just talking and making noise and no one's actually trying to solve anything. And you actually end up becoming rewarded for not solving things. Which is where we are sure. right now. Sure. So that's why I was saying one's not better than the other. It's like you said, what's the motivations and, and, and the, the strengths of the people who are playing their role? Like Marlon, he just up and fired Javier. Didn't ask nobody. He just fired. Him. And every once in a while, he'll just decide to take people off the monitor or off the screen. Just because, you know, we pointed out that New Edition is a Jackson 5 clone. I literally kept my mouth shut the whole time. I was acting good. I kept Because he's mouth a benevolent, shut. because Marlon is a benevolent dictator. I kept my mouth shut. This is what I get. You see, now I'll be punished soon. Because no, not punished. soon. Now. You're going to be punished now. All right, my sexy potatoes. We are going to go ahead and shut down the first hour. <laughs> We are Wait, please, please. It was yesterday. Oh my gosh. You have, to, you have to watch the show from yesterday. You understand what I'm talking about. We are going to go into the second hour with the Am I the A-Ho positive story of the week. A mafia video of the week, which is going to be really different because I'm going to need this on it because this is going to put on the mafia videos of the week. That's going to be very understanding as we get closer to it. And of course, Foxy's video of the week, three minute break to reboot and refresh. And we'll see everybody on the other side. You sets and potatoes, you stay tuned.
we are back. And without further ado, let's go ahead and pay those bills. Saturday Night Vibe tomorrow to Saturday Night Vibe next Saturday at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Please tune in because, you know, we'll probably just do a whole bunch of more ready story. Please do not forget to go to patreon.com forward slash Tracy Media Fan. Help support Tracy and all of her endeavors. Please do not forget to go to Ad Hard's website, BoreliaCentra.com. Learn something that you didn't think you need to know, but you should. Please do not forget to go to Theus's website, OurUnitedCore.com. Help support Theus and all his endeavors. And if you need to leave me a message, you can do so at R-A-D-T-P at Outlook.com. That's RadTP at Outlook.com. Hey. Hey. My Patreon is live. Um, if you want to sign up, please do. You can go to Patreon. Is it slash? Is that how it works? It's Patreon yeah. slash. Patreon.com. Four slash. Yeah, and it'll take you straight there. Or you can go to my website, and, and you can find a link there, too. You can click at the header and at the bottom. You just click on Patreon. It'll take you. But, yeah, we're live now, man. <laughs> Very good. And eventually I'll get some content, but I hate recording, so I'm struggling. Yeah, whatever. Okay, you don't need it. Joe, no, he wasn't. You just had to be there. He just picking on me for because I'm bald. Oh, potato ball. Okay. All righty. No. Trust me, it ain't. Believe me. Am I the a hole? Hey, hey, Marlon. Yes. Hey, Marlon. Yes. Hey, 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 Marlon. You say it one more time. Just get the message out. It's the Mama Heart Hour, ain't it? Oh. It is. It is so much the Mama Heart Hour. <laughs> See? Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. That's why with a mouthful of peanuts. Um, Dove dark chocolate. Ooh, I could not eat chocolate this late at night. Oh, no. And pecan and Pepsi. I am on a sugar rush. You will never sleep again. Wow. I can always mm -hmm. sleep. No. Okay. I can drink a Red Bull and go to sleep. No. No. Actually, you know, Red Bull don't just mm -hmm. anything to me at all I anyway. Can I can always go to sleep, though. Mm -hmm. But Red Bull has never energized me or whatever they want to say. It is it nothing to me. So why would mm -hmm. I drink something nasty and it don't work? Doesn't make any sense. It ain't nasty. They they are. That. That's Disgusting. Let's put it in a different way. Then. They got they got watermelon. That's they nasty. got dragon fruit. That's nasty. Both of those are wonderful. Just make sure you don't don't pour it in a cup and look at the color. The color will freak you out because that's not a natural color. This stuff well, like 1980 yeah. science experiment colors, but they taste okay. I'm sorry. What is an ADHD thing? Drinking Red Bull and then falling asleep. Because oh, really? a lot of times people people with ADHD are prescribed stimulants to get going. What is Red Bull? Good. It's good. Well, I don't no know. Poisons. I've never had it, but no poisons. Bad for your kidneys. Bad for your heart. All right, let's go ahead and get into the story. My fiance is an evil gold digger. 
I'm a 28 year old guy and I've been dating my fiance who's 26 for five years. We met during college and we've been inseparable ever since. I currently run my own catering business while she works as a financial advisor. During our relationship post-college, I've earned quite a bit more than her, and for the most part, I'm completely fine with it. I pay for all household expenses and didn't really expect her to contribute anything. She wants to go back to college to get her master's, so I've always told her to save up for college and I would take care of the rest. She's genuinely the love of my life. She's smart, charismatic, gorgeous, and is extremely kind and patient with me. From the moment that we started dating, I felt like she was going to be the best I was ever going to get. So, regrettably, I started treating her as such. I bought her lavish gifts, took her on fancy dinners, and the more my business flourished, the more I would spoil her. A month ago, during our trip to New York, I proposed to her. Up to that point, that was the best day of my life. But the devil had other plans for me, I guess. As soon as we came back from our vacation, the shitstorm started. She started looking for venues and took the charge in planning our wedding. I was genuinely happy and couldn't wait, but when I saw the price of our dream wedding, I started to question everything. With the venue and everything- WHAT?! NO WAY! With the venue and everything else, it totaled $400,000! I mean, seriously? Initially, I thought that she would pay for a chunk of it since she had massive savings by now, but when I asked her, she told me it was your duty as a man to pay for the wedding. We got into a huge argument that evening and I went to stay at my parents' house. I told them everything. I know that I earn well, but there was no way that I was spending half a million dollars on a wedding. My parents were on my side and told me that their friend who plans weddings would give me an offer for a much cheaper wedding. They said that, in the meantime, I should ask my fiancé for a prenup. My parents told me that they always had suspicions of her being with me because of money. They never told me since, in their words, our precious boy was so happy and it wasn't their place to tell me how to spend my money. I called her that same evening and told her I was getting someone else to plan our wedding. She initially seemed hesitant, but later relented and agreed, and then apologized for planning such an outlandish wedding. I went home the next day, and I dropped the second bomb on her. I wanted a prenup. At this, she was not so easily defeated. She went into a full-on mental breakdown, calling me emotionally abusive and a manipulative a-hole. I clearly told her that I've been paying for everything, and as a result, she has a lot of savings. I told her that her refusing a prenup was a deal breaker for me. I told her that I was blindsided by her behavior all these years because I genuinely loved her to death. She then told me that I earned much more than her and it was unfair for me to deny her any part of it as my wife. I just called her a gold digger and told her to get out of my house. She's currently staying at her parents. Her mother's been blowing up my phone, telling me that I shouldn't have proposed something so selfish to her, and that calling her a gold digger really hurt her feelings. She then demanded an apology from me. I haven't bothered responding. To me, this whole situation is insane. Don't get me wrong, I still love my fiancé to death, but this whole saga really opened my eyes to how spoiled and entitled I made her. I feel like I enabled her behavior, and maybe I was wrong for blindsiding her with everything. Don't get me wrong, I'm still asking for a prenup, but I feel like I should apologize for dumping everything on her all at once. Man, break up and move on. Let, let me go first on this one, because I got so much I want to... <clears throat> it's not even a rant. It's, it's more of a everyone sucks here sort of kind of thing because everyone does and it's just my opinion do you really did spoiler pair point blank in the discussion it is what it is and everything else there's some people that can take the spoiling and look at it as love and admiration there's some people that takes advantage of it you just happen to get the woman who took advantage of it you couldn't explain to me in a million, oh, thank goodness it's the mama heart hour. You could explain to me in a fucking million years what the hell came up to $400,000 for a one day damn event. You could explain to me in a million years. And yeah, I know there's some people out there that go, yo, that's possible. I don't give a fuck. You couldn't tell, show me a bill of $400,000 for a one day event. It's a one day event. I don't give a damn what it's about. It's still a one day event. Three, 
And this is why I wanted to go first, because something keeps popping in my head over and over again when these stories keep going on and on and on and on. With people, number one, having people call you to go mother, father, brother, friends, whatever. Initially, I'm going to tell you what old school equipment is. Fuck you, stay the hell out of our damn business. Now I'm going to put that to the side to go to what my initial thing is. When y'all always say, and I want an apology. You do understand, I can give you an apology and don't mean shit behind it. If you just really want to hear the words to make yourself feel better, an apology means absolutely nothing to me if nothing's going to change. In this case right here, I can apologize for calling her a gold digger. Dude, it's true. You shouldn't have called her a gold digger. I wholeheartedly agree with you. I wholeheartedly agree with the mother-in-law for saying that. You should not have called her a gold digger. You should apologize for that. But you do also understand that I can apologize to you for calling you a gold digger and absolutely nothing changes. I still want the prenup. It is still a deal breaker. So just because I apologize means absolutely nothing because I'm apologizing for one snippet of what I did. Not the whole thing. I apologize to you for calling you a gold digger. I still want that prenup before we get married. And it's still a deal, deal breaker if you break it. If you don't sign it, not break it. If you don't sign it. That's it. Um, you kept saying, don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong, don't get me wrong. I'm not getting you wrong. You can still love somebody don't want to be with them. Love is a very hard thing to turn off. Well, it, unless you're theist, but for the rest of the human human people out on the face of the planet, That's love is offensive. a <laughs> for the rest of I've only people. been in love two times and I married both of them so I <laughs> it's very hard to turn off love but love does not always constantly have to have you be in that person's life you know, there are some people who are divorced that still love the person that they divorce. Doesn't mean they want to be with them. Doesn't mean they want to stay with them. Even have contact with them. I love you as a person. I just don't want to be around you no more. So, that's it. Anybody else can go now. So what are you still doing with her? I think you've seen enough red flags to just go. I mean, if you feel sorry for saying something, say you're sorry. Go ahead. I don't think she's going to take a prenup. Prenup, so uh, uh, there's a lot. I don't know, it sounded really messed up. Yes. Just break up. But here's a couple things. <laughs> One, y'all been together for five years and you just now proposed to us. So, you did say that y'all started dating in college. So I hope y'all just graduated a year or two ago. Because, uh, bruh, five years is a long time. Unless y'all were in school, right? So if y'all were in school, I'm an opinion who say it, if you, if it's, if the love is real, it'll still be real after you get your diploma. So if that's the case, cool. Time is irrelevant, whatever. But then, um, yeah, so, 
I get the impression that he comes from money. Okay? Because he went, went to school, got out of school, and started a catering business. That's not a normal path for folks. Okay? And not only that, he comes out of college, starts a catering business, and he's making good money pretty quick. That's also not normal. He's probably got a good network he's able to work with. Them, right? And then he goes to his parents, and his parents, first thing they say is get a prenup. And apparently his cash flow is so strong that it's conceivable that he could float a $400,000 wedding. These ain't normal people. Okay. <laughs> and then she's a financial advisor with a college, with a four year degree financial advisor. She's probably at the low end. She's making 60 at the high end. She's making six figures. So these ain't normal people. <laughs> but anyway, all that. Yeah, bro. If a prenup was a concern. That would have been something that y'all had mentioned while y'all were dating. You might not have had a whole conversation about it, but it would have been mentioned while y'all were dating. You don't do that after you didn't have a fight about the wedding, and now all of a sudden you want to shut the door on everything going forward off that. That's tacky. So you're right. That was wrong. But I would say if you're going to break up with her anyway, which you need to, uh, forget the apology. Help, let that be added fuel for why y'all break up. Because otherwise, you're going to get into it and you're going to apologize and all of that. And then she's going to start crying. And then you're going to start crying. And then y'all going to try to work it out. And it's still not a good fit. So, let's go. Just go. Let the her only, find her happiness. The only thing I can think of that would really take. For well, hundreds of thousands of dollars is some kind of like destination wedding. You know what, a Turks and Caicos or something? I mean, like four hundred grand, like for that to even that's, that's a different level of living. I'm not saying it's not real because if you come from families that are worth a quarter million or, or more money, like. That ain't a big number to y'all. You know, it's not a big number. But if you both come from families that got a couple thousand, <laughs> that ain't, that ain't no, no, no. big number. I'm, and like I said, I was trying to say, I'm not saying it's not possible. And I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm saying. I know. If I'm looking at somebody and you roll up on me talking about some damn four hundred thousand dollars, um, what 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 side of the moon we getting married on? Because I'm trying to figure out where the hell this damn number came from. What you don't understand is it costs money to dye the horses pink, blue, and green, and then you got to go and hire the right production company to get. Enough, you know, little people or children to play the role of the monster, and then you know, gold paint that costs a lot of money to paint the role gold and have an entire Wizard of Oz themed wedding. Yeah, you know? yeah. that's not cheap. Beat your ass in a damn courthouse. You're Anna. so romantic, Marlon. So romantic. Four hundred thousand. I can make it happen for four fifty. Four dollars and fifty cents. That's all it costs. A stamp and a certificate. I and love a, you, baby. And a Red Bull. Now the Red Bull is like four dollars by itself. So, by the way, you talking about this, Mister Romantic? That would bring the wedding to about twenty twenty five dollars, and I that might be a little much, you know, especially if she don't sign that prenup. <laughs> She, she's worth it. She's worth it. She's worth it. <laughs> she's worth it. Let's splurge. We'll spend $100. Let's do it. We can whoa, 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 whoa. See, you too far. I said I'll splurge to 25 Daddy. You, Here you go. To 100 Well, I mean, whoa. to get a nice, low-end, skeezy motel room, that's at least 50 bucks. 
Going back home. What the hell you talking about? I hope. Going back home. We married. Oh, so this y'all you gonna go get married like it was a dinner date. Uh we went out and get married, come on back to the house, we watch some Netflix. And chill. Yeah, let's binge watch some all in the family reruns and uh you know. I'm not even taking Monday off. Hey Anna. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Take your headphones out. Thank you. Positive story of the week. Yes, don't you even start. Don't you even start. Don't, don't even start. Don't even I can hear it. I bet this was playing in the background when Donald Trump and Stormy Daniels got together for their, their meeting. Barry, so it may be more like twenty six fifty. That's fine. She yep, only a dollar yeah. fifty cent there. That's, that's Mr. Romantic. That, that's where that pre dub come in. There. Anyway, in lieu of what's coming up next Sunday, with like I said, we're getting back into uh, current events and things like that, and the fact that I haven't did a positive story in a long time. And the fact that we had so many toxic stories as of late, especially this, please watch the first hour of yesterday's show. I don't like toxic stuff. Oh, dude. Ooh, that woman. I I actually enjoy your attempts at having a positive story. So far, you're like one for four. All right. Positive story of the week. I know what my husband is doing. Dates, and this one is titled, My Husband Doesn't Know That I Know What He's Up To. My 33 female husband, 34 male, and I had our first baby back in June of last year. My husband's aunt gifted our son a lovely, chunky knitted blanket. The blanket is so soft, and I have made multiple comments about how I would like to find a full-size blanket just like it because it is so cozy and I'm kind of jealous of my baby. Well, this past weekend, my husband snuck off to the store. He refused to tell me where he was going and why, but I later found a plastic bag with the logo of a local crafting store. That evening, DH stated that he would like to have an hour of alone time every night after our son goes to sleep. He he stressed that he would not like to be disturbed, but if I needed him, then I could call or text him. I agreed to this because we were both adjusting to to having very little me time since the birth of our son. Yeah, that doesn't really change ever. Last night, during his alone time, our son started crying. I checked the baby monitor and saw that he had simply lost his pacifier and was going back to sleep. However, the baby monitor also shows part of our son's room, not just his crib. In the corner of his room, I saw my husband sitting on the floor with a bunch of chunky yarn in front of him. I turned the volume up and heard that he was watching a YouTube video on how to finger knit. This sweet man is making me a blanket. He absolutely loves surprising me, but is terrible at keeping secrets. I just know that he's going to slip up and accidentally mention something about the blanket at some point. I plan on acting clueless so that I will still be surprised when he gives it to me. I just love him so much, and I'm so delighted that he's learning a new skill so I can have a custom blanket. Relevant comments. Comment here. OMG, the title makes it sound like it could have been something else, but it's so cute. Also, why do men seem to always forget about the baby monitor? Update March 13th, 2024. The original was posted February 26th. Brief backstory. I posted recently about how I checked the baby monitor while my son was sleeping and saw my husband sitting on the floor of my son's room, finger knitting a blanket for me after I made a comment on how I wanted a chunky blanket. My sweet husband broke. He kept on mentioning that he was working on a surprise for me. I would occasionally ask what the mystery project is, and he would get a cheeky smile and say, I can't tell you. That eventually evolved into him repeatedly telling me that keeping the surprise was really hard, and he wanted to just tell me. I kept saying, no, you've kept it a surprise for so long, you can keep going. But one day after dinner, he decided he couldn't keep it in anymore. He showed it to me. It was only about a quarter done, but it was lovely. The yarn was really soft and was my favorite color. 
I could tell he had taken his time because of the consistency of all of the loops. Even unfinished, it was perfect. He told me that he kept moving it around to different hiding spots, but since our house is very small, it was only a matter of time before I accidentally found it. He said he had run out of yarn and asked if I wanted to pick out another color to add to it. I said yes, and we made a little date out of it. We grabbed lunch and then walked around the craft store before I picked out a complimentary color to the one he chose. He hasn't had much time to work on it over the last few days, but he assured me it will be finished by my birthday. I'll post a picture of the blanket when it's finished. For now, I am wildly impressed with how long he kept it a secret, and I'm so excited to have my first ever handmade blanket. Top comments here. Comment, OMG, I was ready for another unhappy story, but this is the sweetest thing I've read on this sub. What a sweet, sweet man. This is such an asshole. It's just... You literally well, I was just, to be I was just resting for a second. First of all, first of all, you're not surprised because you decided to, to, to sit there and eavesdrop on them because um, you could have just like not zoomed in, but you did. So you can you can kill all of that. Well, you know. He's still going to surprise me. No, you, the surprise is dead. You know it's not a surprise. Um, but, yeah, still, he's trying to do something nice. Uh, but, buddy, um, you ain't never learned about the economy of time. You, what you should have done, put some money together, go to your auntie who knows what she's doing, pay her to make the big blanket because all she wanted was the blanket. You didn't waste time learning a skill that you have no use for. Bruh, pay your auntie. She might need the money. Might encourage her to start that new business venture that she might be interested in. And you're giving her the opportunity to really see that there's a market for her talents. She gets you a full-size chunky blanket. Your wife gets a beautiful chunky blanket. It's just like the one that's for your baby. So now there's even that wonderful. Oh, it's so wonderful. And then you get all the credit and you did to sit there at YouTube and learn how to knit in 2024. I'm just saying, bro. I mean, that's real nice. But really, that was the best use of your time. Um, but anyway, yeah. She going to cheat on you later. She's going to let you know. She don't respect you, dog. Wow. First of all, I could, I, 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 I honestly, I can't even look at his face. I seriously just can't even look at his face anymore. First of all, no, it would not literally be the same for the person who the last segment he kept sitting there talk calling so romantic, so romantic, so romantic. It is not, does, it is nowhere near the same thing of saying my aunt who I paid to make you a blanket. It is a lot more romantic to say, I learned a skill, whether I use it this one time and this one time only to make you a blanket just for you, your husband, not my aunt that I paid. Just, that's the equivalent of went going. I went to Walmart. I learned a skill that I have never learned before, and I'll probably never use again to do something just for you from me, from a feigning observation from the wife. It ain't like she was hounding him, saying, "Oh, I wish you would make me a blanket. Oh, I wish you would give me a blanket." It was a feigning gesture. Oh. That's a lovely blanket. I wish I had something like that. And that dude went to work. And Thiers is sitting there, and, and as soon as he put his hand down, waving stuff around, I bring him back up. But until that point, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> okay, unfortunately, my internet is acting really strange tonight, and I missed a lot of the story. So basically, here's what happened. They just had a baby. Dude played himself. No. no 
Let me get the story out. They just, OP and her husband just had a baby. Um, o, OP's mother or aunt made them a real thick blanket for the baby. OP was like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm so jealous of that blanket because it's so soft and it's so thick. The husband came home one day and said, um, I'm going to need some time by myself. I do not want to be disturbed. Could you just, you know, let me have an hour or a day to myself without being disturbed? Of course, if you need me, you know, call me. But if you just don't need me, you know, just let me be. And the wife said, I understand because since the baby has come about, um, we all need that me time, you know, because we've been all with the baby. Mm -hmm. Well, started crying and she looked on a monitor and just saw that the baby's pacifier fell out, but the baby was falling asleep on his own in a way. But in the corner of the monitor, she could see her husband sitting on the floor knitting her the blanket that she was asking oh. for. And looking at a YouTube oh. video on how to do so. Wow. Um, the ending of it was he was very bad at keeping a secret, so he just couldn't hold it in no more, and he was running out of yarn. So he finally told her, hey, this is what I was doing for you, but I'm running out of this color. Do you want to go and get another color so I can finish the blanket? And they made a date out of it. And she found a compatible oh. yarn to go with it, and he finished the blanket for her. It was the same thickness. It was the same softness. It was the same everything. Mr. Romantic over here wants to go to Walmart and just get a damn blanket because he played himself mm -hmm. and decided that he going to give his money to some 90-year-old aunt who decided, oh, I know how to knit. Let me start a business. Okay. Oh, that's so sweet. See, you can you can disagree without making up stuff. See, I said get it from the aunt because the aunt's the one who made the first blanket. The aunt's the one who made the first blanket that she fell in love with, and then the aunt would be the one who could make another blanket just like the one for the baby, just bigger. That's what I said. I ain't say nothing about no Walmart. But yeah, anyway, that cool. That cool. And check this out. If you've ever had a baby monitor, you can zoom in some. But what baby monitor you know, unless the baby monitor is sitting over his shoulder up high so he can see what he's doing with his hands and pick up what he's watching on TV. Because apparently she was able to not just see he was knitting, not just see what, what style of knitting he was doing, but also see that he was watching a YouTube video on how to knit. Man, well, that's a good it monitor. It hurt the man. She turned the volume up and she was able right. to hear. Man, that's a good monitor. And ma'am, you stayed on that scene long enough to hear what the video was talking about or see. What the video was talking about. So, why did you watch for so long? Good night, LL. Ma'am. Ma'am. Demons in the details. Parker, Parker you've been hanging. You've been looking at. You've been look, looking at things too long. She's gonna find a better nick. No, she. No, this is what's gonna happen. This is what's gonna happen. She's gonna love that blanket. And she's going to really appreciate that blanket. And then she's going to try to tell her friends about this wonderful blanket. And her friends going to be like, your man knits? And then she's going to start second-guessing her wonderful husband, who's such a nice man, who, who, who took time out from his diesel truck repair company to learn how to knit a blanket. And, and then and she's not going to appreciate it no more. And then she's going to start to like look for a dude who doesn't knit? She wants to do who sews. You know what I'm saying? Because you know, and then now what? 
he done lost everything. I fully blame myself. No, Anna, I do. I fully blame myself on everything. Because this is us when we always try to, we put these little toxic stories on here. And even when we put a positive story on here, there's always got to be a toxic ending. Look, here's the funny thing about it is, because I cut out a lot of this video because it was like six, seven minutes long. Thank goodness, because that was a long story. But this was yeah, it was longer than that, but it was a lot of comments, <laughs> and it was funny that a lot of the commenters were saying, ooh, I am so glad about the ending that you went out on a date after the, he made the, you know, the blanket and everything. And some of the people really was saying, I was so prepared for you to say he made the blanket and sold it to pay off gambling debts. Or he made the blanket and gave it to his mistress. Or he made the blanket and then held it for ransom until those people have problems. I just he figured made, he wanted an hour to watch some porn before he went to sleep at night. There were people who were literally saying they were so expecting a toxic ending because just so when you listen to these stories. See, the internet just stopped so Marlon so that I can help out. So here's the thing. Yes, these stories do be incredibly toxic. And that's why I don't really get to them. If you notice, when he does his toxic story, I usually put a positive spin on what's happening and, and all that. But then these goofy-ass stories about a man sitting boat, sitting cross-legged, what is it, crisscross applesauce, finger braiding, net knitting, netting, Knitting multi Pandora's blanket, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm I'm gonna pick at that one. I'll pick at that one. I mean, what kind of light he got going on? The baby supposed to be sleep. You sitting here watching a video, baby trying to sleep. That baby didn't spit out that pacifier. That baby couldn't go to sleep. Irresponsible dad. Next time, go knit in the go sit the car and knit. Mafia video of the week. You can knit in the tub. This, you can knit in the back porch. This, this, this. You haven't been on the show, and I miss you so much up until this point. So you haven't seen the videos that we have been playing for Mafia Video of the Week. By the way, you know, another PSA, we will be getting back into um, George Collins' soft words um, probably starting next week. Um, but Anna has started a revolution that has expanded to her, that has expanded to Foxy, and I'm not going to lie, they kind of span to me too. So, you know, because I'm the one that's putting it on. So, I'm going to play three videos in order of which I think is the funniest. From the least funniest to my favorite. I just want you, who has never seen any of these videos, to yay or nay or I disagree or whatever. I know you Am I disagreeing with the order? Or you, that you disagree with the order? Okay. Of how funny they are. Or uh, how funny they, they are. So, okay, now is this based on Anna's humor or your humor? No, it's, it's all your humor. What do you, it's all oh, okay. you. What do you figure is funny? Because you all may right, not we'll find it funny. Who knows? How I have no idea because it's funny as crap on some of these. But in a way, what I figure is the number three in my book for three to one, number one being the funniest to me. Three to one, this is number three to me. 
In my super fundamentalist Christian youth group, we were doing a Thanksgiving dinner for the homeless. And there was this guy who was sometimes weirdly flirty, and he was chopping up these sausages. And then he licked his finger and said, these sausages are delicious. And then I said, are they? And then for some reason, he immediately stuck his finger in my mouth. And I sucked the sausage juice off his finger. And then in horror, realized the path was standing right there and saw the whole thing and the look on his face was something I've never quite seen before it was like confusion and a loss of innocence and then he weirdly smiled and said you guys have a special friendship and then a little bit later I saw the pastor throw that tray of sausages away Come on, give me number two. Just, just, just bring me number two, because that right there was just disturbing as hell. You, y'all don't know each other. Somebody just stick his finger in your mouth, and you be like, "No, nah, we, we, there's some issue." I mean, did he wash his hands before he put his finger in your mouth? That might not be sausage juice. That might be a different sausage juice that you just you just sucked off this man's finger, and you supposed to be in the church basement feeding homeless people. Just, just nasty. <laughs> Bravo to the pastor for throwing away the sausages because they were tainted. Those are those are those are those are, de- those are double dicks at that time. At that point, those are double dicks. You just gotta you gotta toss those out. You know what I'm saying? And just, you know. All right, number two on my list of the most funniest. It was the 90s, and we were at the Fall Festival, and there was this game where you threw darts at balloons, and the prize was either these weird mirrors with heavy metal bands, or you could also pick a goldfish. And I really wanted the goldfish, and I popped a balloon, but my friend was like, don't pick a goldfish, are you gay? So I was like, no, and I picked the Twisted Sister mirror. But actually, I wanted the goldfish, I just didn't want anyone at the Fall Festival to think I'm gay. But looking back, I wish I had been brave enough to be myself at the Fall Festival, being gay with the goldfish, being gay with the goldfish, sing it with me, gay with the goldfish, being gay with the gold. <laughs> <laughs> that window is open and there's two guys who could totally hear me. <laughs> Okay, first of all, being gay with the goldfish is 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 a contradiction of term. That's bestiality. Bestiality is not homosexuality. Um, you just gay. Okay, you know, and it's funny. Here's the funny thing: you just gay in the '90s sense of being gay, when everything was gay, even though you weren't gay. It was just gay that you wanted a goldfish instead of no, no, he, he's thing. gay. He's gay. Is he gay? I don't see how he's gay. He just seemed a little flamboyant because he was really wanting a goldfish. You know, the man wanted a goldfish. That don't make him gay. I had a goldfish from the carnival. I'm not gay. I'm just saying, you know, and by the laws of transient, transient properties, because I'm not gay and I had a goldfish from the fair, he too, but, but he didn't get goldfish from the fair. So, we are not the same. So then if I'm not gay, that does make him gay because he did not get the goldfish. Oh my god. I'm sick. Sure. No idea what the hell he just said. And no, I sure as hell do not want you to explain it again. My number one video and Anna and Foxy, y'all better come up with something better. Cause this is still gonna be my number one until y'all find something better. In my super fundamentalist church, we did not speak in tongues, but we were open to the idea of speaking in tongues. And that Sunday morning, I sort of knew I was going to do it because I'm dramatic. And in the middle of the service, I said out loud, Shamala Hamala. <laughs> and everyone around me was like, oh my God, it's happening. And everyone started saying Shamala Hamala. And I was sort of like, you guys are just copying what I'm saying, but now we're all crying, saying Shamala Hamala. 
<laughs> and my pastor said it was the language that angels spoke. And I imagined the scene in heaven where the angels were like, what's up, Jesus? Shamala Hamala. <laughs> that one is the best one, man, because I could see me doing that. Shamala Hamala. They'd be like, oh, look, at we all speaking Shamala. Wait a minute. Hold on now. I know I made it up. So that means you made it up. So, and that's just the hook for my favorite song. For, uh, it just says Shamala Hamala is part of the, the lyrics. And so Jesus and I like the same band. Therefore, my favorite band is in fact Christian rock, even though it's saying as an R&B group, Shamala Hamala. <laughs> Okay, here's the deal. Because I wanted the, to the see what one. was my favorite one. Because I said this to Anna, and Anna didn't, was surprised. I ain't going to say she didn't believe me. She was surprised. I said, it's so, the two things that made it so funny to me. One, I'm sorry, I'm still going to bust out with What's Up, Jesus, Shabba Muhammad. And I'm sorry, that last part just killed me. I'm kind of over it a little bit, but man, that I I died on that. What's up, Jesus Shabla Hobla? Second of all, I've heard that in a church. I've heard Shabla Hobla. You ain't heard no Shabla Hobla. I did. I did. I've heard that. I've heard Shabla Hobla in the church. I don't know if this is coincidence. I don't know if it's you know, but yes, I've heard those two words put together. Shabala Habala, and of course a bunch of other stuff, because it ain't like they say Shabala. But you know they always sound the Shabala same Shabala. though. Uh, say that again. They always sound the same. Like the person who seems to want to speak in tongues, each time mm -hmm. they speak mm -hmm. in tongues, they say the exact same string of gibberish. Yeah. Like they practice this thing. You know, I, I would just be so tempted in my ignorant self to sit there and be like, you a lie. Just to see, just to see everybody's head explode. You said that last week. Yeah. I'm a homola. I'm a homola. How it be thy name. I'm sorry. I've heard those words before. This <laughs> and that's the way she, that's the way the angels speak. How you know? And that would be interesting instead of angels talking. And then you know what's funny though, this was really hilarious to me, right? Like y'all all trying to do the the, the 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 talk thing, the talk thing. But like the rule is always supposed to be some unrelated cat who can decipher what you said. And that person just never seems to be there that Sunday. I don't know. No, I never heard that one before. That's a new one. No, that's part of the gift of speaking in tongues because God is not an author of confusion. So if you are speaking in tongues, that means you're speaking in a, in a language and a dialect that man has not heard of. There's supposed to be an interpreter who is able to decipher what you said. That person never seems to be present. But everybody get to talking in tongues, though, because they're saying they all being touched by the Holy Spirit. And that's fine if you say that's what's happening. But I'm telling you that uh, I don't think you're telling the truth. I think you are being deceptive. Shamala Hamala, y'all. Foxy's videos of the week. <laughs> Go ahead and get into it because I held this video for the longest time. It was not, not the longest time, two weeks. Um, because I wanted Diaz to see it because Diaz would understand exactly where I'm coming from. I'm not taking anybody down because crap, a lot of these are short. 
So I'm not gonna take anybody down, but this, you know this person. You you really do know this person. Best way to me is just all of a sudden get confused and can't find the gas pedal. <laughs> I sit there and have a praise break at the red at the green light. Shamala, Shamala, I'm just gonna sit there. <laughs> By the way, hi Foxy, I heard you in the background. I heard you. You were agreeing with me. I appreciate that. That's so cool. She would not agree with you. She literally. That's how I heard it. That that how I that's how I heard it. But she is leaving now because she has a new position at work. So. She is out of here. Congratulations. Yep. Is she headed to work? No, 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 no. No, she's headed to bed. Congratulations on bed. the new spot, the new, the new elevation. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate it. And all right, let's go ahead and get to let's get to the next video. Now, some of y'all men want to be gentlemen i appreciate it really do need more of you out there just don't attack the woman trying to be a gentleman <laughs> Why are you that was. I don't think that I saw the. That was. Don't think that's. Don't think that's how that works. Um. Don't. I don't think I you're think supposed the first to part got Cut off for me. Uh, let's try. Now, basically, this is what it was. And here's 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 the scenario, right? All right. She is walking ahead of you. So she's going to reach the door before or ahead of me. Right. So she's going to reach the door before I will reach the door. And I normally would want to open the door for. Her. So I instead of having anticipated this and speeding up so that I could get to the door first. Instead, I scared the crap out of her by yelling at her and then racing past her to then open the door and say, I'm just being nice. Because what woman doesn't like to have a strange man run up from behind her and um yo? Here you go, Emma. <laughs> gentlemen, gentlemen. And he grabbed her too. Ooh. Yeah, so he was oh. extra chivalrous. He was an extra gentleman. That yeah, was strange. Yeah, it would be. How women apologize compared to how men apologize. And the reaction. I would like to say that that is unfair, but mm -hmm. I done lived that. Just saying that weird, that weird, awkward, just just come up close and wait for a hug, and that's that's that was the apology. There was no words, so, so you know, implied. Now I don't know about that second part. Well, her doing all that's. That's next level. That's um. They need counseling. You think? Because who gonna clean up all that spaghetti off the floor? You know how hard it is to get spaghetti off the floor. That's just what spaghetti. Or whatever she knocked out of it. Wasn't he holding some flowers and some spaghetti or something? I don't know what he was holding. Huh? Flowers. 
She knocked two things out of his hand, I thought. Oh, no. Just anyway, he, whatever. And it'd probably be Next him. time he needs to bring better gifts, and she, she probably wouldn't do that. Next video. <laughs> bros helping bros. I'm going to let you know right now this wouldn't in real world. <laughs> I like, missed what, what flag. Like, was he leaning over to look or something? And that's why he went uh, low with the uh, deck? Uh, that's why he went, when he went low to look, old boy went low to like, hey, this is how we handshake. We both go low to handshake. Like, I'm trying to save you from. That's just too, that's just too that's just two good baptized believers who are excited to be in each other's presence. And, you know, and they just, that's how they greeted each other. Hey, fellas, in the real world, that ain't gonna work. Let's let you know that now. No, because he, he instantly knew. He was like, you know, I don't even think they knew the women were there, man. Like it was just so excited to see each other. It's like, ah, what's up, man? That oh, God. that's God. brotherly love. That's nice. That's better. I didn't even know you was here. Because they were so excited about seeing each other. Have you not ever been so excited about seeing your friend or seeing your other half? And like the whole world, you just missed that all that fades out, and it's just you just excited to see that other person. And then the world comes, you know, re rebounds back like like an action movie. Yeah, that's what happened. Nope. Nope. And I'm going to move on to the next video because this just literally made it worse for every man on this planet because the shit wouldn't work. Don't do I, it. If I made it worse for any of y'all, that's because y'all scared. Be scared. Man up. Man Don't up. Man don't man up. Don't man up. Do not man up. I'm scared of your woman. Be scared of your woman. Scared of your woman. You scared of your woman. You scared of your woman. Man, you scared she gonna beat you up. She gonna beat you. She gonna knock the flowers out your hand. That's what she gonna do. That that's what happened. That's what happened. See, that's why you scared. Last video of the night. Try to end the show off on a good note and try to find talent out there. It's been sporadic. But I really love who, I don't even know who this woman is, but I appreciate the skill that she has. Um, it's tap dancing, but the fact that, you know, every tap dancing has a certain rhythm, you know, whatever the tap dancing is, is there's a tur there's a certain rhythm behind all the tap dancing. This woman is well, actually guilty feet able ain't got no to rhythm. duplicate. Hi, Anna. This woman is able to duplicate the tap dancing rhythm without actually knowing in advance. First of all, 
they're in the same dance troupe. So she just knew the routine because it had nothing to do with the rhythm or the tempo of what was happening prior to them joining in together. So they really were mirroring each other at that particular point because you can't have someone going one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, pause. And then you come in together one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. The two things had nothing to do with each other. It was cool, it was fun, but it was rehearsed and and it was just, you know, what it was. But I love seeing the people doing the dance stuff though. I think that's dope. Because it looks it looks easy until you try to move your feet like that and it don't turn you don't come out nothing like that. This needs a vacation. I do need a vacation. But what I said is still true. Watch the video. It, they, 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 they don't they don't go together. Oh, when you look at that, my internet is going down. God dog. Good. I really would listen to you, but my internet is going down. Yes, tell everybody where they can find you. Well, until his royal highness kicks me off again, uh you can find me here sporadically. Uh, as my schedule permits, because we're about to go into summertime, so my weekends, my daughter's going to take those from Um But ourunitedcore.com. Check me out. Anna? Borrelia, et cetera, dot com. And I apologize for my internet tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, non-conformant individuals, and of course... I'm assuming you're a legitimate club. I appreciate this. I appreciate Anna. And until next time, we will see you when we see you. Peace. Yeah, I ain't really got much except to Where has Lindsey Graham been lately? Sits and potatoes. The people that brought you sexual.